There is a myth that in the United States, things like malnutrition and child brides don't occur. But as long as we remain a patriarchal society, unsupported, uneducated mothers and their children remain vulnerable to such dangers everywhere, even in the United States. I know this from experience. If we think of patriarchy as a dominant social system, a system where one portion of humanity exploits and dominates another portion of humanity, where everyone is struggling and competing for resources, then its opposite would be a partnership social system where resources are shared to the benefit of all, where the health of an individual means greater health of the community, where healthy, happy children mean a healthy, happy future. More like a cooperative village rather than a tiered hierarchy. I can't help but wonder how my story might have been different if I had experienced a partnership model of living. As it was though, I fell prey to a sexual predator at age 14. This podcast, Breaking Down Patriarchy, has inspired me to begin to tell my story. It's my hope that the telling of it will keep me grounded on my healing journey and perhaps inspire others to open their hearts and minds to imagine a better world. If we can dream it, we can achieve it. This podcast is paving the way and I'm thrilled to be a part of it. So let me give you some background. In the 1950s, my parents were on course to live the American dream. They married in their early 20s, as was common then, and quickly settled into gender roles, where my father was the breadwinner, and my mother happily began her life as a stay-at-home mom. I was the firstborn and would be the only daughter. But the dream wouldn't last long. By the time my mother had her third child, my father had a growing restlessness, and he started to wander. I was mostly oblivious to their initial strife as I was busy being a kid, discovering a deep love for music and dance. I had an active imagination, and I would fantasize about life as a ballerina. I lived all day long in a tutu and tights, and I danced everywhere. I would have loved dance lessons. My parents had other concerns. In 1963, the beatniks were paving the way for the hippie revolution. Timothy Leary would soon urge people to tune in, turn on, and drop out. And my father did just that. He joined other restless seekers, people who craved a more authentic way of being, participating in pilgrimages to India, and a communal lifestyle that had a closer relationship to the land. For three years, my father lived a double life. His participation in our family dwindled as he began exploring other possibilities with other women. He tried unsuccessfully to manage both lifestyles, and he spent less less time with my mother and more and more time with a woman who would later become my stepmother, a woman who was also a restless seeker. My mother became suicidal. When she discovered she was pregnant with her fifth child, it snapped her out of it, thankfully, and she made the decision to live for that child. Without telling my father, she sold our house in Southern California and hauled us all up to Alaska to live with her best friend from high school. Her friend was married with five children of her own, and they were wintering in the basement of their unfinished house, but she invited us anyway. Five months later and eight months pregnant, my mother decided to move us to Mesa, Arizona to be near her younger brother. Yes, from a winter in Alaska to a summer in Arizona. It would be there in Mesa that we would experience abject poverty and I would fall prey to a sexual deviant at the age of 14. I'm choosing my words carefully. I want to be fair and accurate in the telling of this story. I used the word predator at the beginning and now I use deviant. Are these words true? A predator stalks their prey looking for the vulnerable. I'm not certain how long he watched me walk to and from school before he approached our house. I only know that he did watch me. 
In a healthy social system, he would have walked away once he had learned I was a child. I know this because that's what a healthy, mature bonobo ape would have done. Bonobos are genetic. Bleh. Bonobos are genetically our nearest mammalian relative. They have a more partnership style social order. They are unashamedly sex positive. Immature, immature females with budding sexualities experiment, sometimes with mature males. And the males may allow it, but they never penetrate an immature female. I was gobsmacked when I learned this in college. If he wasn't a deviant, he would have not, not, he would have not penetrated a 14 year old. It was 1968 when we arrived in Mesa, Arizona. I was nine years old with four younger brothers ages eight to newborn. After a long and intense period of postpartum depression and PTSD, my mother eventually found employment as a stock worker in the cigarette smoke filled basement of J.C. Penney's. Full time minimum wage kept us in groceries for about four days of the week. The other days we went hungry. Childcare was a problem and we and we often were left at home alone after school. There was lots of fighting. No one told me things like brush your teeth. We all lacked basic care. I would lie awake at night and worry. If Child Protective Services ever found out about the squalid living conditions my brother and I were in, they surely would separate us. None of us wanted that. In 1973, five years later, I turned into a leggy 14-year-old. A cabinet maker, a man who owned a shop across the street from my house, took notice. He asked my mother for permission to date me. She agreed against my protest. Because of his presence, I had more access to food and basic care. I started eating better. Along with that, my mother also got a new set of kitchen cabinets. My world of puppy love, closed mouth kisses with boys my own age was over. Within two months time, this man would sexually penetrate me. I've not mentioned yet that the man who darkened my mother's door was of the Mormon faith and that my father was from the poor deep south. In both of their worlds, sexual involvement with a girl this age was not unheard of. I understand now that a 14-year-old girl is still very much a child. This fact pains me deeply. From 1969 to 1975, from ages 10 to 16, I lived part of the summers in hippie paradise with my father and my stepmother, where people worked together sharing resources and responsibilities. Meals came from our collective gardens. We would all swim and bathe nude in the South Fork of the Trinity River. In the evenings, we, were, we would gather around the campfire to play music and sing songs. We were wild, happy children in nature's abundance. The rest of the year was spent in malnutrition hell with my mother. Arizona winters were indeed cold, living in a drafty ramshackle shack with paper walls we subsisted on government ration, grade D, canned ham, and blocks of cheese. My mother was depressed and despondent much of the time. The fighting amongst my siblings was fierce as we grappled with neglect and scarcity. The disparity of these, the disparity of these two contrasting situations was not lost on me. I empathized deeply with my mother's situation and in many ways, I too felt the pain of her rejection. I also empathized with my father and saw the value in his new lifestyle. When I think of the whole situation while looking at it through a lens of partnership social system, I picture my mother and her children being embraced and supported by the community. With the patriarchal dominant social system in place as it was, we were discards dependent on a cruel and shameful welfare system. I'm sure we weren't the only ones. In 1975, at the age of 16, I was legally emancipated by both my parents in order to marry the cabinet maker. That's when my trouble really increased. 
Domestic violence is a peculiar and insidious thing. It started after the dinners I would prepare for us. At the end of the meal, he would finish his glass of milk and then flick the last drops in the bottom of the glass in my face. He accused me of not having a sense of humor. He started to treat me like property. Now that we were married and sex itself wasn't taboo, the sexual abuse ratcheted up. I was smart enough to divorce him at 17. I was a senior in high school. By the grace of God, there were no children between us. In 1976, Peter Frampton was making the bicentennial scene. I waited tables, went to an alternative school, and had a studio apartment I shared with a roommate. I danced for fun at the local disco. Then I lost my roommate and came precariously close to being homeless. I was seeing a man who was as close to living on the streets as I, and we pooled our resources in the interest of mutual survival. Only months into our relationship, he would hit me. But I had nowhere to go. By the time I was 18, I was pregnant. I knew deeply that I wanted to keep my child. I thought I could do it on my own. I was so wrong. It was a complicated birth. Now the father of my child was a resentful sole breadwinner with two dependents. The emotional, the emotional and physical abuse continued. I learned how to avoid most of the physical abuse by disappearing whenever he was around. He too accused me of not having a sense of humor. I was never right in any disagreement. I had no voice. Just days before my 23rd birthday, I gave birth to my second son. It was an uncomplicated natural birth and I could feel a growing sense of empowerment in my body. Regardless, or because of this, in 1983 at 24 years old, I have a messy breakdown. I fled my marriage and landed in a heap at my hippie parents' doorstep, still nursing my 16-month-old son my five-year-old son left behind in flight. It would be three painful years before my ex-husband would reunite us. I would receive very little child support and I had no means of pursuing it legally. I needed to work and my experience with domestic violence landed me a good paying job as a social worker in rural Trinity County. I set my sights on obtaining a higher education. As a working single parent of two growing boys, I obtained a Bachelor's of Arts degree in studio art and a single subject teaching credential. It took me eight years to do this on welfare because I also worked part-time and it was important to me to be there when my boys came home from school. Here's how I thought about welfare. When I first came to California, I met a hippie woman from Santa Cruz who had the cutest little toddler girl. Out of curiosity, I asked her what she did for a living. She replied that she worked for the government. She did not look like a government worker. So I asked her what she did, and she said, I raise healthy children. It is this mindset that makes me determined to persevere through the shame involved with accepting welfare, and I keep my eye on the prize. I wanted healthy, happy children, and I wanted to be a public high school teacher. I thought of welfare as my supportive community, my supportive husband. I was just finishing up my general ed at community college in, 19, in 1988 when Reaganomics put a two-year cap on welfare benefits, only enough time to learn a trade. Thankfully, I had social service angels on the inside who got me through to my goal of being a teacher. During this time, there was a lot of healing, soul searching, and hard work. I would rediscover my deep love for dance and creativity in the visual and performing arts. I would feed the soul of the dancer and artist in me finally. In a surreal moment, the summer of 1991, I would find myself leading a colorful parade of 30 drummers and dancers through the streets of downtown Chico, California. I, the disappearing battered woman, was now the founder of a thriving community drum and dance troupe leading a parade. It's a moment I could have never imagined 10 years earlier. 
It is this love of dance that lands me my first teaching job as an art and dance instructor at a high school in the California East Bay Area Delta. I would receive Teacher of the Year twice in my 25 year career there. I had found my niche. I was finally thriving. I kept a special eye out for students who might be tr having trouble at home. 22 years ago, I adopted a 16 year old student of mine who was being neglected and I consider her my daughter from another mother. She's the one who dropped everything and moved in to take care of me when I was diagnosed with stage 4C ovarian cancer two years ago. There's nothing like a radical reproductive surgery and six rounds of chemo to make you reevaluate and reflect on your life. Healing from that experience literally ripped the scars off of all those old wounds. I grieved intensely for the 14-year-old in me. I grieve for the young mother. I grieve now for my damaged body. I'm cancer free, but my left leg and foot are damaged with lymphedema and neuropathy. Doctors tell me it's a lifelong condition and it dominates my life. As a former dance and yoga teacher, I understood the lymphatic system some, but now I have a much deeper experiential understanding of it. It's all about flow. My leg is like a barometer. If I feel tangled up and congested in any way, either mentally, physically, emotionally, or spiritually, I feel it all in my damaged leg. The telling of this story has been an emotional heavy lift, and my leg gave me trouble as I wrote it. My left leg is teaching me to understand the value of observing and releasing grief as it arises in the body, and the need to let those emotions flow when they arise. This wisdom is a gift, I have received from my father and stepmother who discovered Vipassana meditation. The seekers found what they were looking for. There is a family joke that even though my father's departure caused much suffering, he was able to find a solution to end that suffering through meditation. Even though it has been a struggle, the telling of this story is helping me process and release those issues in my tissues. It's my sincere hope that bringing situations like mine into the light will help create the changes being called for in this podcast. I hope it will have a butterfly effect and guide our grandchildren and our species as a whole toward a more peaceful existence on this planet. Before I end my story, I must share that in 1999, my mother was diagnosed with lung cancer at the age of 63, probably as a result of working in that smoky basement at J.C. Penney's for almost 20 years. She was given 18 months to live. My mother was cared for tag team style during the entirety of those 18 months by me, my four brothers, my father, and my stepmother. Before she died, we were able to honor her as the matriarch of an intact family. My father and my stepmother were present for much of her hospice care. There was a deep healing during that time for all of us. My mother said it was the happiest 18 months of her life.